What is up and welcome back my Canadian cousins. I'm so glad to see you again. It's been a minute since I've done a video, been very busy with life and as as things tend to be. And so uh, I've been very much looking forward to doing this particular video. That is timely for two reasons. Number one, I did a video uh, about a month ago that I posted a month ago from when I'm filming this. And it was on the Avro Avro. And what I discovered during that video was that as tragic as the Avro cancellation uh, project was, which was a state-of-the-art, for those of you who don't know, a state-of-the-art interceptor um, aircraft that was developed by the Canadian aerospace company Avro in the 1950s. And I know that it is still controversial, it's cancellation, and that it still hurts. And you wonder what might have been with uh, the Canadian aerospace industry had the cancellation of the Arrow not happened because it effectively destroyed the industry for uh, quite some time, and maybe irreparably. What came out of that is that a lot of the Avro engineers were hired by NASA to work on the Apollo project, which ultimately landed people on the moon. It's also timely in a much broader sense than my little YouTube channel, because just last week, NASA named its four astronauts that are going back to the moon, not landing, but going, but flying back to the moon um, and circling it uh, in the next Artemis mission, which is Artemis II, and it will be the first manned Artemis mission. And among those astronauts is a Canadian, a Canadian astronaut named Jeremy Hansen. And that must be very exciting. I, I'm excited about it. I really am. And I'm very, very glad that they picked him. I'm going to be doing a companion video to this specifically about Jeremy Hansen and about uh, his participation and Canada's participation in the modern um, Artemis space program, which is much more international officially than uh, Apollo was back, you know, in the 1960s. But and, and early 70s. Um, but what I'm learning is that, you know, I've always known that, you know, unfortunately, and this is the ugly truth that both the United States and uh, the Soviet Union took uh, German Nazi rocket scientists. We have Werner, Werner, Werner von Braun, you know, in charge of the, the terrible V2 rockets that uh, rained hell fire on London and, and other targets towards the end of the war. But, you know, they helped launch both the Soviet Union and the American space programs. I prefer to look at this much more pleasant view of others' participation in our space program that I didn't know about, our friends, uh, our allies, our colleagues across the border in Canada. And so there is a video called The Moon Landing and The Maple Leaf, and this will inform me, and hopefully you all, much more about this. And then a companion video will come out either at the same time, and I'll link in the description below, or very soon after uh, about Jeremy Hansen and the modern uh, Canadian participation in the Artemis project. Okay, my friends, I will see you on the flip side. It is, to this day, even five decades later, one of the greatest achievements in human history. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. It was a giant leap shared. A celebration without borders. The world watched two men step onto the moon, but carried there on the shoulders of thousands. No one has ever gotten to space alone. NASA I recognize him. Um, I know he's a Canadian astronaut, and I remember seeing him on the International Space Station playing a guitar and singing uh, David Bowie's Space Odyssey. NASA calls them the heroes behind the heroes. Men and women on the Chris ground, perhaps, but who gave Hadfield, years to maybe? the mission. And that Hadfield? includes Canadians. 
We were all working crazy, crazy hours. Oh, it was ridiculous. There were a lot of divorces. There is also a Canadian twist, another chapter in the broken dream of the Avro Aero, Canada's supersonic fighter jet. Ottawa kills the program just as the U.S. looks to space. Basically, the worst thing to happen to Avro was one of the best things to happen to NASA. The contributions of Canadians to Apollo 11 are largely overlooked, but much of it was critically important and is today a source of immense pride. Mankind went to the moon for the first time. I was involved. <laughs> How lucky can one guy be? Do you think Canadians are aware of the contribution that Canadians made? No, they're not. And the contribution was enormous. I would say, uh, is that true? First, I'd ask if that's true. And then I would say, just knowing the uh, average viewer to my channel and the comments I get and the people who have subscribed, that that is probably not true, that you are all extraordinarily well informed and I've learned a lot from you. So, this anyway. This is the story of the Canadians who helped put footprints on the moon. How the start of the space race led to a dark day for Canada. One small step for man. And that giant leap for mankind. It was this sound that signaled the start of the space race. Sputnik. When the Soviet Union put a small satellite, Sputnik, into orbit in October of 1957, it made that beep. Transmitting the now familiar beep beep. And spread fear. Always remember, the flash of an atomic bomb can come at any time. Duck and cover, my parents or you know, especially my mom, who was a little bit younger than my dad, tell me that they used to do that. Uh, <laughs> like um, being in the New York metropolitan area is gonna, uh, they would be safe by going under their desks, but they did what I guess they thought was comforting. It's the middle for of the Cold War, a time of extreme tension the between the world's two superpowers. People lived with the constant and real threat of nuclear annihilation. When Sputnik Soviet technology pulled ahead of the U.S., it was flying overhead and no one knew what it meant. The idea that you could put a satellite up in space, then that sort of spurs this idea of what if you can put uh, nuclear bombs on these satellites and you can kind of toss them down on a country that could land anywhere and you'll never know when it's going to show up. This was, you know, nobody had ever seen anything like this before, so it was terrifying. Sure, and it was more than that because these rockets that were launching into orbit became internet, you know, the 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 experimental um, precursors to intercontinental ballistic missiles. So I think this video is going to go into the Avro project, the Arrow project, and it is a necessary precursor to this. And I will certainly post this original content in. In, in the description, but I'm not going to, I think I'm going to skip over some of it only because I don't want to be repetitive. I have an entire video about the Avro Arrow and it tells that story in much more detail. You know, in, in short, it, it, the, the Arrow was an immensely uh, advanced aircraft for its time. And controversially, it was canceled by the Diefenbaker administration. And there's a lot of different theories about why that was and whether it should have been. But I'm going to pick up, I think, on this video about where the project was canceled, what it did to Avro, and why uh, the uh, engineers ultimately ended up in NASA, because that's really what I want to learn. And it builds on a prior video I did. Okay, my friends, let's continue. This was the day of the Arrow's big official unveiling, October 4th, 1957. Thousands packed the tarmac at the plant. What no one knew at the time was their big splash was about to be totally eclipsed. It was the exact same day Sputnik was launched. You're trying to, to roll out this brand new technology that's going to, uh, you know, kind of quell the, the Soviet threat. In a Talk way, about and bad timing. Up the ante incredibly in the same day. That's bad luck. Yes, very bad luck. What it meant was bombers weren't the big problem. It was now rockets and missiles and space. With the Arrow's strategic value declining and costs rising, 
the Diefenbaker government killed the program. How did the announcement come out? The uh, company had a PA system, I guess, all over the plant. As, as of now, uh, all employment is terminated, and wow. everybody left it. No. <laughs> wow. <laughs> 14,000 people thrown out of work. Arrow engineer Owen Maynard went home to his family. It's a day his son will never forget. I was at home and everybody was all upset. My dad had just been laid off. Everybody's wringing hands. My grandfather was really upset. I think the next day my dad was out at de Havilland looking for a job. The Canadian government tried to sell the Arrow program but couldn't find a buyer, so it ordered everything, the planes and the plans, destroyed. But as that was happening, NASA took notice. The agency was expanding to fight the new space race, and suddenly Canada had this big pool of big talent all unemployed. Basically the worst thing to happen to Avro was one of the best things to happen to NASA. In a matter of days, NASA recruiters were working the phones. Within weeks, they were in Canada for interviews, and barely two months after Black Friday, Maynard was a NASA employee and his family was living in the U.S. We moved to Virginia in April of 59. That so pretty was quick. quick. They could have gone the route of uh, visas, work visas, but they went straight to green card. So the, they were basically, these guys are coming and they're staying. They wanted these engineers and they made it happen. Yeah. NASA. I mean, obviously, like they said, they wanted the engineers and they made it happen. I, I, I tend to think also that, you know, there was less of a, security concern and in the time that we're talking about now there was probably some comfort in knowing that these people were Canadian rather than anybody else. Hired 25 engineers in one fell swoop and went back a couple of months later for five more. About half were Canadian and half were British. But it was a massive injection of talent from Canada. 30 engineers joining the manned spaceflight program at a time when it only had around 100. They have been described wow. by some of the re recruiters from NASA as a godsend. Jim Chamberlain was one of the engineers scooped up immediately. He was originally from Kamloops, BC. Chamberlain had been the chief of technical design on the Arrow. He went on to be the chief designer of NASA's Gemini program, the predecessor of Apollo. <laughs> it's not hard to see his impact. The Gemini and the Arrow share a striking feature, the way their hatches opened out from the middle. If you look at the... That, that, that's really important. Uh, wow, chief uh, of Gemini. Gemini was super important and it gets overlooked because Mercury was the first to put people in space. We, but Mercury was a very basic spacecraft and in order to get from Mercury to Apollo, Gemini was really a necessary interim step it was uh, where they developed and practiced docking, which became necessary to land on the moon. And uh, they did their first ex EVA spacewalk. It was super important, and it's really interesting that this Canadian engineer was in charge of that project. And on the arrow, you'll see, hey, we've been there before. <laughs> Brian Erb's first job with the space agency was testing heat shields on Project Mercury, NASA's first spacecraft. But in the summer of 1960, he was put on a special committee studying the mm. future. They formed what was called an advanced vehicles team. And there were eight people on that. I was the thermal guy. To catch up, everything was on the table. Even the idea of sending astronauts out to space on a one-way trip, knowing they'd never return. That was not politically acceptable to NASA. <laughs> the logical thing is to go to the moon. It's not gonna be satisfying enough to just do a loop around the moon on a free return. Ultimately, we got to land. We choose to go to the moon. The goal was made official with John F. Kennedy's seminal moonshot speech. Now, NASA, with orders in hand, had to figure out how to pull it off. Sort of like the dog that's run after the school bus and catches it, you know, what, do you, what does he do now? Uh, holy shit, where? <laughs> <laughs> you had some work to do. <laughs> we got some work to do. <laughs> you know, I, I there is, uh, a wonderful mini-series that covers this from the Earth to the Moon. But, um, Tom Hanks is the executive producer, and of course they don't mention 
Canadians, although they don't mention where people are from in general, uh, and maybe that just wasn't a consideration, but it would have been cool to uh, somehow incorporate that into that miniseries. The Americans started the space race by stumbling out of the blocks. Is that a fuel leak there in the first section of the three-stage rocket? Some would call the U.S. response to Sputnik Dudnik. Dudnik. Meantime, the Soviets kept piling up records. The first man in space, the first man to spend 24 hours in space, and the first probe to the moon. You'll be sure we are behind. But Kennedy made space a national priority, good versus evil, the only way to prevent the new frontier from becoming a new theater of war. The problem was, when he made that pledge, NASA had put an astronaut in space for a grand total of 15 minutes. Alan Shepard in May of 1961, and it was basically just up and down. The idea of somehow putting a man on the moon by the end of the decade was even to astronauts and some senior NASA employees, breathtakingly ambitious. The Avro engineers had joined NASA as a group, but fairly early spread out. Mission control, telemetry, safety. Bruce Aikenhead, originally from Didsbury, Alberta, went into astronaut training. Oh, wow. He worked with the Mercury 7, NASA's first class of astronauts. So of course I, I've known that there have been Canadian astronauts that have been, uh, you know, in space for decades uh, now, um, flying on the space shuttle on the International Space Station. I didn't know that there was any in the astronaut corps that early. A group that included Shepard, Gus Grissom, and John Glenn. NASA's astronaut corps expanded in 1962 with the hiring of a second class, they'd be called the New Nine. In that group, a young test pilot from small town Ohio, Neil Alden Armstrong. NASA was also expanding geographically, opening the brand new Johnson Space Center in Houston. Most of the Canadians had been based in Virginia and were now on the move to Texas, but busy. We were all working crazy, crazy hours. Oh, it was ridiculous. Ross Maynard still considers himself lucky. I'm going to back up a second. This They keep talking about Ross Maynard, uh, the son of one of the engineers. He keeps He's sitting in front of this design drawing for the LEM. And there are also, if you look here on the table, little models of it. And I suspect that he, his father, I mean, had something to do with this, which is very interesting because that was designed and built here on Long Island uh, by the Grumman Corporation. And a lot of people in my father's generation who friends of mine and my uncle, uh, who were en young engineers at the time, worked on the LEM. And it was built here on Long Island by the Grumman Corporation, which eventually was merged with Northrop and taken off of Long Island and moved to Florida. Um, but yeah, I, I'm very interested to see how this Canadian engineer, what his involvement was with the LEM. Ridiculous. Ross Maynard still considers himself lucky his parents stayed together. The divorce rate was higher with NASA's engineers than astronauts. There couldn't be anything more interesting for an engineer than sending someone to the moon. Right. That was the top of the game. That was the, uh, the best game in town. So if you're working 10, 12, 15 hours a day, that's not terrible. They loved it. They were into it. Lift off. All that work meant progress for NASA's second generation of spacecraft, Gemini. That's the ship designed by Canadian Jim Chamberlain's team. It was Chamberlain's craft that helped NASA catch up with the Soviet program and eventually pull ahead. He gets a huge amount of credit for the success of Gemini. You, you had the first uh, rendezvous and docking in space, the first American spacewalk, and it trained all those astronauts and the controllers for some of the problems they were going to deal with uh, in Apollo. It would be NASA's third gen of ship that would win yeah. the race to the moon. Chamberlain was instrumental in critical decisions there as well. He was one of the prominent and early voices pushing for a lunar orbit rendezvous. Instead of one big ship going all the way to the moon and then landing, Chamberlain argued for a lunar lander that would detach from the command module and then descend alone. What Chamberlain did is that he saw this and he thought, this is a great idea, and he started drawing up this thing. He proposed to land what he called a bug. 
This is the spacecraft which will carry two astronauts to the surface of the moon. And the Lunar back. Excursion Module, LEM for short, would be designed wow. and built by Grumman Aircraft in New York. But no one at NASA had more input than Owen Maynard. He was in... So this is very interesting. They did show in the, From the Earth to the Moon where NASA had some... NASA, NASA, I said NASA because I live in Nassau County, New York. Uh, which is the first suburban county on Long Island from New York City. But NASA, uh, they did show in that program how they had some basic idea of some bug type of landing craft that they were going to use that they gave to Grumman, and then Grumman had to figure it out. So it seems like Maynard was the one who came up with that idea. Brilliant. He was in close contact with Grumman. His son remembers the day Maynard brought home an early model of the lab. One day, he's still there. We're up, we're, who are you again? And at which point he goes over to this big fat briefcase that he's got, he pulls this thing out. That's it. That's how we're gonna go to the moon. That's, that's what's gonna happen. Dad, you've got to be kidding. That thing will never fly. This is a full scale mock-up of the lunar excursion module. To build the LEM's legs, Grumman would turn to a Canadian company. They couldn't find anyone in the U.S. able to build what it needed. In the actual case, this pin release oh. is performed by a, an explosive device. Those legs would be built on this factory floor at a landing gear company outside Montreal. We all wow, I never knew that. That, that is fascinating. I thought the whole thing was designed and built by Grumman here. Wow. Already we're doing uh, landing gears for Grumman, uh, manufacturing new parts. The company that they hired to, to do those uh, legs uh, couldn't do it. So uh, since we, we already knew each other, they said, well, Iru Dev Tech, are you interested? And uh, well, we said yes. We wanted to be part of the history. There's a part of one of those legs at the Canadian Aviation and Space Museum in So it's not just the engineers, it were, you know, actual, an actual Canadian company that built these legs, which is uh, kind of cool because uh, Canada has been on the forefront of robotics in space ever since they built the first generation of the arm for the um, cargo bay in the space shuttle and have continued to be on the forefront of robotics with the, with the, uh, Canada arms ever since and other and in other respects so good at building good at building legs and arms my Model. friends each part was milled out of a solid we couldn't do anything with without them alloy supplied by NASA we had never used that before and we've never used it after and even meteorologists today I mean and, and, and never saw that one big problem was how to get the LEM and the command module to the moon they'd have to travel more than 380,000 kilometers and back that whole That's time, all. one side would be facing the sun, the other, darkness. They had to design a ship that could deal with 120 degrees Celsius on one side, but 150 degrees below freezing on the other. Canadian Brian Erb had a better solution that was also lighter and cheaper. He came up with the idea of balancing the temperature by slowly rolling the ship Rotating. like a barbecue. The astronauts, he says, didn't like the idea. Yeah, I, I got a lot of pushback, you know. They thought that the rotation would be troublesome physiologically. It wasn't an issue. It was so slow, it wasn't an issue. It, it seems like a simple thing, but I, it must have been very strange to suggest it. How important was that? Well, I'd like to think it was absolutely critical, of course. <laughs> He's being modest, I'm sure it was. We have a go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one. All those years of work would pay off in July of 1969. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins, and Apollo 11. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. On July 20th, one of the iconic moments in human history as Armstrong steps off the ladder attached to the Canadian made landing gear. Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon on this July 20th, 1969. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. 
What? <laughs> the world was watching those first steps. In fact, Brian Erb had made a new purchase for the big night. We did have an old black and white TV about so by so with a screen this big. So we splurged and bought a console color TV. <laughs> so, and you had people over that and night? And we had people over that night. And, and how special was that moment? Oh, you know, <laughs> one of those signal moments of your life. Wow. Setting up the flag now. This moment on the moon, the planting of an American flag, is something a Canadian at NASA had argued shouldn't happen. Owen Maynard was Apollo's chief of systems engineering. In that position, he'd spent years worrying about weight and space on the lander. He thought adding the stars and stripes was a mistake. In fact, he argued so much, NASA went around him. The flag was built by an American, and Maynard would say it was basically smuggled on. Beautiful, just beautiful. The trip back to Earth would be three days where a million things could still go wrong. So that's interesting. He argued against it and, uh, you know, they're saying he was arguing the weight factor and maybe that was all it was about. My first inclination was that maybe he just politically thought no single country should be planting a flag that in history has always implied colonialism and ownership. And, um, Maybe he thought that that wasn't the right thing to do. And this wasn't entirely an American achievement anyway. Um, look, I'm, you got to give a lot, of, uh, a lot of credit to the United States to have the political will and spend the money to do this. And it very much had to do with the Cold War. Um, but we have to recognize the contribution of others. And, you know, in thinking about the political issue, I might agree with that. I might agree with that. It does smack of colonialism. We're claiming the moon for ourselves. This was an American achievement. We did this. Um, I mean, I don't have a problem with like, you know, raising the flag in justified wars, you know, like over Mount Suribachi on uh, Iwo Jima. But uh, yeah, then again, I'm looking at this at 2023 and not in 1969 and the world was very different than at the height of the cold war so i don't know i guess that's a question and debate for another time he didn't ross maynard who joked about his father's spaceship felt like he'd witnessed a miracle i think it's ridiculous that they actually pulled the whole thing off it boggles <laughs> the mind that they were able to it accomplish does. what they accomplished without even a calculator yeah yeah slide rules Pack of cigarettes, cup of coffee, go get them. When the Apollo 11 astronauts returned to Earth and were hoisted into the air, in the helicopter waiting for them was a Canadian, flight surgeon Bill Carpentier, originally from Vancouver Island. When they came up into the helicopter, one by one, and I got a thumbs up from each one of them, and they were feeling good. That was the most important moment for me. Now, there was real fear the astronauts could bring something dangerous back from the moon, mm -hmm. some sort of moon germs that could threaten the Earth. It was sure, unlikely, but not impossible. So as a precaution, the astronauts were quarantined for 18 days. Well, that's Carpentier in the orange flight suit. He was a medical doctor and was locked up with them. Oh, it meant agreeing that if something awful happened, he could spend the rest of his life in quarantine or worse. The whole facility could be buried with everyone in it. It was the price of having a front row seat to something special. Wow. You couldn't help but be aware that this is history in the making. How lucky were you? Very lucky. You are looking at one of the luckiest guys that was born in the 20th century. That is what I regard myself as. I love that attitude. I love that. Special. When the president visited the quarantine facility, Bill, Buzz, and Mike, Carpentier was just behind the astronauts, and he was busy. <laughs> On top of caring for the three men and taking blood samples, he also had to collect and prepare the moon rocks they'd brought back. Mm -hmm. It was while doing that job that he opened a bag and got a surprise. The lunar dust just flew out, and it got in my nose and my eyes, and it. it made my eyes water, made my nose itch. You know, it was something in there. <laughs> I, 
I, I sort of said it's, to me, is a combination of wet ashes and gunpowder. There was a moment during some downtime when Carpentier broke a rule. Without telling NASA, he'd smuggled something into the quarantine facility, a bottle. Unknown to anybody, I mixed martinis. <laughs> and we toasted the flight. And that was the first time that I really Come thought, on. yes. You gotta. They went to the moon and returned safely to Earth. To you guys. Cheers. But there will only ever be one giant leap, something that left a giant legacy. The very famous one, this one. Former astronaut Julie Payette grew up with a collage of Neil Armstrong and Apollo 11 photos on her bedroom door. She went to space twice, both times feeling she was following in the footsteps of giants. The fact that they were American and I was Canadian, that they were guys and I was a girl, or that they spoke this language I barely understood at, at that age, English, uh, was not even something I thought about. I wanted to do the same thing as them. Oh, yeah. Former astronaut Chris Hadfield's five missions to space made him a global celebrity. But it all started as a nine-year-old watching that moon landing at a cottage when his parents let him stay up late. It changed how I looked at the moon. This isn't um, a distant, unattainable thing. This is a place that people go. People that I could turn myself into. Hadfield says after that night, every decision about his future was weighed based on what would get him to space. It demonstrated uh, what people are capable of, no matter where they're from. Owen Maynard, who ended up going on to be one of the chief engineers for the lunar lander. That was a guy from my hometown. The contribution was enormous. Mark, good luck. Yeah, Chris, Chris Hadfield, yeah, he's famous. I, so he's playing, playing the guitar, he's playing a different song, but I definitely saw videos of him playing David Bowie's Space Oddity, which was so cool. Garneau was Canada's first astronaut to make it to space. He went up in 1984 oh, and had two other missions. But Garneau says it's important to remember Canada's involvement in space didn't start space with arm. him. And when I was down in NASA myself as an astronaut, many of the people who were still around at that time often came up to me and said, you know, Canadians made a huge contribution, but it's not well known. When the astronauts were home, safe and sound, and spoke for the first time, Neil Armstrong's first words were to share the glory. He and Collins and Aldrin had accomplished something monumental, but not alone. It was our pleasure to have participated in one great adventure. It's an adventure that took place not just in the month of July, but rather one that took place in the last decade. Over that decade, Canadians were there. There were Germans at NASA as well, but they were together working on rockets. The Canadians were spread out and moved around. Show me a model of that rocket, point to something, and I could tie my father into that, and I can go on for four hours. After Apollo's success, some of NASA's Canadians would return home, some would stay in the US, but they'd continue to make an impact. The space shuttle, the space station, the Canada Arm, the training of Canada's astronauts. Avro engineers had a hand in all of it. There is also a part of Canada that remains on the moon today. On each Apollo mission, this is 17, the Canadian made legs served as a launch pad. All six sets of landing gear that set down on the moon are still there. Apollo 11's descent stage sits today on the Sea of Tranquility in the exact spot where Armstrong and Aldrin touched down, undisturbed for decades. A memorial in a way connecting Canada to the greatest feat of ingenuity in history. One that ended the idea that humanity had limits and Canadians were a part of it. 500 years from now, a thousand years from now, and people look back and say, Mankind went to the moon for the first time. I was involved. <laughs> How lucky can one guy be? I love it, my friends. I love it, I love it, I love it.
That was really cool and super informative. And uh, I feel proud to, uh, you know, that our engineers worked hand in hand with the Canadian engineers. And as they said, sort of at the end, the Germans, you know, particularly in the early days, helped with the rockets and they were uh, sort of to themselves or worked together, whereas the Canadians maybe integrated better all over the space program with, with the Americans. And so, you know, you, we really worked together and it just stands to reason that we would uh, be able to fit in very well together. Um, yeah. So look, uh, I'm, I'm excited to look at going from Apollo to Artemis. Uh, the Artemis mission is very much more of an international cooperation. Um, I believe the Europeans built part of the the, the, the part that's going to uh, carry the cargo. And the Artemis mission is much more sophisticated and it serves a larger purpose to ultimately have colonization on the moon and use it for staging ground to launch a mis mission to Mars. So the fact that the first manned mission back to the moon, um, albeit to circle it, at the end of the day, of the hundreds of astronauts that have been to space, almost all of them have been in Earth orbit. Very few, maybe two dozen, have actually gone beyond Earth orbit and flown to another interstellar body uh, in the form of the moon. And in the next mission that will be happening relatively soon, Jeremy Hansen, the Canadian, will be among a very select few people who have ever done that and the first non-American to ever do that. So it is certainly going to be a milestone. And uh, check out my video on that, which is coming very soon. All right, my friends, I will see you soon. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye. Nothing left to do